Hi. Welcome, everybody. Would you please stand and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll do a roll call just by calling your names out. Uh, Jennifer Bretz. Here. Uh, Diane Civitoti. Here. Sonia Bragic. Here. Uh, Dr. Jeannie Smith. Here. Vince D'Augustine. Here. And Mike Alferi. Here. Tony Bompiani present. We're waiting for Scott, uh, er, Scott uh, Learn and Paul Ward. At... move on to the mission statement. I'll be happy to read that. Good evening, everyone. The Hemphood Area School District, in its commitment to excellence, shall engage and educate all students for personal success through a shared responsibility with the student, family, and community in a safe, secure, and nurturing environment. Thank you, Dr. Willicki. We may as well go right into the superintendent's report. You'll welcome our new guest. I will. I'm not a guest anymore. No longer a guest. First day on the job and has jumped in. <laughs> And it has been a busy day indeed. So welcome to Hemfield area to Dr. Kimberly Riefenack. Dr. Riefenack joins us from the Huntington Area School District, which is near Penn State and extends all the way to the Raystown area. I know whenever we were talking about the geographical size of Hemfield area, she said to us it may seem very large, but in comparison to the district she's coming from, it's actually um, not as large. Yep. Yes. So Dr. Riefenack was sworn in this morning. We um, went to the office. Um, Judge Mark Mansour um, swore, did her commission first thing this morning. So she has been sworn in and started at 8 o'clock, and it has been go, go, go ever since. So I'll give you a few minutes if you'd like to say a few things just to tell a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm in a season of transition, obviously. It took a little while for me to get here, but it's been a good time to close out from my previous position and start here. Um, my family and I will be moving to the area at the end of the month, so we're very excited to join the community um, and be a part of uh, the district. So Hempfield area, I'm excited to call home now. And as uh, Dr. Lucky said, jumped right in both feet. So here we go. Thank you all. I think speaking for the whole board, we're very excited to have you here. I'm sure the staff is more excited to have <laughs> you uh, rolling up your sleeves and pitching in. And welcome aboard to Hempfield's family. In addition to welcoming Dr. Riefenack, I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to Mr. Greg Saracini, who is here with us this evening, because he has been a tremendous help in the interim in fulfilling all responsibilities that he possibly could to assist. And we just greatly appreciate, I mean, numerous hours through the weekend continuing to work on, on tasks just to be sure that we could continue to move forward. So thank you. It was greatly appreciated. You did a wonderful job. So the second part of my report, I would like to have some discussion with the school board in regards to a request that has not yet been brought forward officially as a motion, and it's information that has been brought to my attention, and there, has, there have been some discussions. I want to first, to first say that uh, Mr. Rob Bajarski, as the president of the band association, has been really um, working very hard to um, collaborate with Mrs. Charlton. Uh, Mr. Rieger, myself, and now Dr. Connor has been included in our meetings. Um, just with all of the, the changes that have had to occur um, because of the pandemic, the band has really been in a situation where they are working very hard, of course, to continue to provide as many opportunities for the band members as possible, um, but giving, of course, consideration to all the safety considerations. So initially, the band um, was considering a trip to Hawaii, and certainly, um, they have been looking into all the restrictions. I know at one point Hawaii required, uh, once you arrived in Hawaii, you had to be quarantined for 14 days before you could even leave your hotel room um, in order to, um, you know, to be a part of um, anything, any activities. So I, I'm not sure if that has changed. I think there was, there was some discussion of um, looking at a negative test within so many hours before you departed um, the mainland to be able to travel to Hawaii. Expense. Um, has been a consideration because each subcell, of course, is a huge profit um, for the band, and they have currently, I believe, missed four, if not five, subcells. 
So the most recent discussion, and I, I attached a letter here, which it's, it's addressed to me, but I do want this to be shared with the school board because, um, again, overnight trips do come to the board for consideration, but certainly it's something that um, I have been giving, given great consideration to in regards to this request. So in their letter, they are talking about a change in their trip from Hawaii to Tennessee. And there is a rationale. There are rationales um, in regards to the travel, you know, traveling certainly by bus versus by plane. Uh, they talk a lot about the itinerary and the safety considerations. And again, I, I want to commend the, the uh, individuals that are involved in the planning. Certainly, you're going to see there's a lot of attention to detail, uh, looking at um, cancellation policies and um, all the safety factors. They have included even if a student becomes ill, what are some of the considerations and saying certainly if that happens in Tennessee, it would be easier for a parent to get to, to a, a child. I shared um, when we met last week to have this discussion that I personally have a lot of concerns. When you are um, planning a trip first that would be looking at May, I think there are some um, challenges with planning something now and not knowing where we're going to be in May. And while certainly we want our students to be able to have many opportunities, we have to do so with great consideration given the, the pandemic and not knowing where we will be at that time. And the commitment to a trip to me, um, is something that I have concerns. I also started looking through some of the details and there were some, um, the indications that I'm asking, how are you going to have students travel on you know, buses? Will they be seated side by side? And even having a, a one student per seat in a row um, still has students in an enclosed area for an extended period of time. Also staying in the hotel rooms, they're looking at two individuals per room. I, I question social distancing when you're sharing a room with someone. Uh, the meals they have included, uh, they would be eating in restaurants and I would think it would be nearly impossible to socially distance six feet uh, my band of our size in restaurants. So I wanted to bring it um, forward just to make you aware that the request is being um, compiled. They are asking what are the concerns at this point because certainly it's their goal to address concerns so that the students can continue to have a trip this year. I certainly feel for the students in knowing that they are looking forward to a trip and I know it has become tradition that there's a trip every year. My bigger concern is their safety and taking on the responsibility for something of this scope, um, especially given the time. I would like to, to um, hear from the board as to your thoughts and concerns or you know, considerations in moving forward so that they can be shared with the board, um, with the band, so that they can either come up with an alternate plan. Um, I'm very happy to know that the band had such a wonderful opportunity for their trip last year. I think if this does not come to be, I, I think at least our seniors, hopefully were able to participate in that trip and be a part of it. But I guess I just, in bringing it forward for all of you this evening, want to, to ask your thoughts of our band traveling. I'm sure we will have other requests for other trips, certainly if this one were to move forward, and just not sure at this time being able to commit to such a trip. You want a question? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. So uh, Paul and Scott, welcome welcome to the meeting. Um, and we're gonna get started. We're live right now. We're in, in a public session. <clears throat> so I'm gonna just go around the room and have all of you put your two cents worth in on the band trip. Uh, Mike, I'll start on this side of the room. I, I think with the current situation, it, it is um, worrisome. Uh, that being said, we, we none of us know what really is going to be going on next March. But um, I, I'm just wondering if, with that many people, is there any way they could just do a, a senior trip or condense it so there isn't so much exposure? Uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned with all the seniors, not just the band, but you know they're, they're really the ones kind of getting penalized with all this uh, again I don't I don't want to take away from the juniors and you know, the underclassmen but just wondering if, if, if they could do something seniors only and minimize the exposure I would wonder with the instruments for them to perform it would depend upon the instruments that the 
I believe there are only 25 seniors this year. I could be wrong with that number. But thinking about if they were to perform, but maybe it becomes more of it's about the trip versus the performance. Mm -hmm. It's an idea. Thank you. Vince D'Augustine. Um, in the trip letter, it says May, but in the itinerary set or the uh, price says March. Is it May? Departure says March. I, I think at this point it's up in the air. I know in May there were some conflicts with Keystone exams, AP exams, and I think that they're trying to push it back as long as possible, just thinking that that may have the circumstances be better. But at the same time, there are many other activities that they're working to schedule around, such as testing. I'm not sure if it would be March or May, whichever oh, okay. I believe would best fit into the schedule. No, I, I, I kind of think the same thing with that Mike said. I would have some worry with traveling with that amount of people. Um, if we condense it, that would be good, but I don't, I don't even know if that'll work. Um, what is the deadline for them to know? Do we know that? Obviously, they're going to raise money as they're going to raise as much money as they possibly can. Is there a deadline that they put on there? I didn't see it. I didn't no. have a chance to really look through it. And I don't know that I have a specific deadline. I think it was more about raising the money in the event that they are able to go. There was something about 30 days with the bus. I did see something in here. Okay. If I can find the printout. Uh, it says, yeah, it says they can be canceled 30, 30 days. days. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And that was for the buses or the rooms, or was that? That was for the buses. I'm sure the rooms could be canceled before that. So yeah, I don't know. I would have some. I would have to think about this a little bit, a little bit longer to make any kind of decision that I think would, because it's a big decision. Obviously, it affects them. And we do not need to have a decision this evening. This is really just preliminary and sharing what discussions are being brought to us. They've not yet um, formally requested because that would require a board motion. So we do not have that at this point. Before we go to the next uh, board member, um, if we did say, yes, we're going to do this, because everybody wants these, these students, particularly the seniors, to be able to do it. I, I would think everybody wants them to be able to do it, to enjoy as much as normalcy as they can. You even mm -hmm. said that. Right, right. So if we, my only question would be, and then take it to the rest of the board, if we give them the okay to, to start trying to raise the money, if they can do it safely, a lot of things are going to change by next March, a lot of things. And um, they're changing already, it looks like, on some of the stuff. So it would be tragic to decide now no, when all we have to do is tell them, yes, raise money, but if it's dangerous, we're not going to approve it when the time comes, something like that. So I don't know where that leads, but I mean, that's a whole lot easier to swallow, and then they could use the money for something else if they wanted to. But Jeannie, go ahead. I didn't mean to. Well, I was going <clears> to <throat> say something similar, and I think that both Vince and Mike were alluding to the same thing, that it's, it's, it's very difficult to make a decision right now because things change daily, oh. and we don't know what's going to be happening in March or May, whichever that date may be. Um, so I would say go ahead and try to raise the funds, and then we'll make the decision on the very last date that we're able to make it with safety our main consideration yeah i, I think that's excellent but bearing in mind we want them to go i mean it isn't like we're going to make you raise the money and then oh you're not going no, anyway no we, we want them there we would i think we would all like everything to be back to normal as much as possible and to have these kids be able to do all of the things that they do <laughs> and it's just you know, we can't make that decision right now it's too soon. because of the uncertainty. Sonia? I'm, I'm not going to be labor. I would agree with what everybody has said, but I think the other sentiment I would put out there is that I think for consistency, then that would have to be the same protocol because I would agree with Tammy. I think once this request is out there, I think you're going to have requests from other groups because I think there's a lot of groups that, and I'll use the um, competitive cheer is one that they typically go away for events in January, January or February, I believe. So I, I think everybody is probably on that, that same fence right now, seeing where we're at. So I think, sure, go ahead and raise, but I think that, um, I don't think any of us would be comfortable saying yes at this point. Okay, Scott? 
Yeah, I, I agree also. I mean, I don't think there's any way we can make a decision right now. So I, I just think that these groups should plan to whatever they can do. And, you know, obviously there's, there's students raising money. And if they can, you know, if, if they get a no in, in, in the end of this and they, they can pull their money back up, I mean, they can figure all that out. But, you know, it's just it's fairness to each group. And uh, I think we're going to have to approach it like that. Diane? I, uh, boy, this is tough. <clears throat> I, I understand what everyone is saying. I'm also concerned about them making subs. Is that, is, is that what they're planning on doing to raise the money? That, that is next on the list, yes, okay. because that will lead to that discussion. And that, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really concerned yeah, about that. I'm concerned about uh, in May doing it because the seniors have so much going on in May that, that I think that would be difficult. I feel better that th this year's seniors were able to go on a trip. Um, I think if, if we wait too long to say, if we would have to say no, I think it would be harder on them because they're, they're planning for it. I, d I think this stinks. I mean, it really, it really upsets me that we can't give these students what we all want to, but we're responsible. And I just, I, I, I have a real hard time taking a chance with any one of them, and I think this would be taking a chance. Jennifer? I agree with Diane that um, maybe um, the raising um, funds through maybe um, subs is maybe not a good thing because of the COVID. Um, I think also that um, that um, we should maybe wait as long as possible um, till next year. You know, I think that have them raise funds and um, and next year, you know, weigh the options because, you know, the COVID, everything's changing from day to day to day, week to week to week. So, I mean, I think that go ahead and have them um, raise funds and then see what happens next year. I would hate to see them not be able to go. Paul? Um, I guess I, I would say the first, um, I agree with everybody in terms of, you know, decision on a trip at this point is premature because, you know, the thought of social distancing and all that, it, you know, so backing up to now, I mean, I think if we can give them an opportunity or at least hope that something, you know, may be able to be done, uh, uh, allow them to uh, do some fundraising in an appropriate way, and then it gives them the, the chance for it to happen. Uh, you know, everybody, you know, needs to understand, though, of course, that uh, as everybody's already said, nothing is approved as far as the trip itself. Um, it's been said several times around the table here that um, things have changed and they're changing daily pretty much. I mean, we couldn't imagine three or four months ago, you know, somebody standing outside selling subs, but in the, over the past two weekends, I've gone past groups that have been selling subs. Um, it didn't seem as crazy as it did a few months ago, and I think things are going to get better. So is it ideal? No, but um, it, it would be naive to think also that this group you know, they've spent a lot of time together already, so it's not like these are strangers coming together and that may pass a virus. They're already spending time together. So I think that, that also helps reduce the likelihood of the virus amongst, amongst the group. You know, I think that's just real, being realistic. So just overall, I guess I would support appropriate fundraising and then put the uh, decision of the trip on the back burner. Okay, and, and I, any other comments from board members after you've heard the other one? Okay, so I, I would think, uh, Tammy, that they, they would, and if you disagree, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I would think that we'd like to see them come up with what their plan would be to fundraise, how they're going to follow the, the appropriate recommendations or, or um, things to, for safety, and to make sure that they know they can plan whatever trip they want to next year, but we've got to wait till it gets closer there and see how safe it would be. I want, just want to make one comment that I think we really need to be aware of as a board. Um, there are several things we look at for this district is not put the district in peril, and one is liability factor. Um, before that, though, is the safety of our children with anything they do. 
and we do want them to have the full experience of education. And band and trips and cheerleading and trips and these things are part of the full education of our children. We all want them there. And so I think we need to make sure we don't put shackles on ourselves and then put those shackles right on the children. We've got to bear in mind, and I, I'm not saying this because I'm saying we just need to open up the floodgates. We have to bear in mind students, young people, aren't at risk like older people are, much older people. They're more at risk not to have a normal lifestyle and not to have normal things. And I think everybody said that. Excella told us that when we were meeting with them. That doesn't mean we just open up the floodgates and go. But that mean, means we as a board shouldn't worry about liability and all these other things because their parents are signing off to take them, their parents are raising the money with them, and the adults are involved in this. They're making those decisions. We need to give them, be able to facilitate it for them in a safe way. So raising the money, and I think what the board said is totally appropriate right now. Show us your plan, how you're going to raise it. Raise it, but understand that if things go south or if things even stay the same and it's bad, you know, we're not going to take a chance on anybody's lives. But is that okay with the board? Tony, are you um, thinking about them, if they do make subs, they will be making the subs? They won't be buying them? Well, I, all I'm that, saying, I, I'm not going to tell them anything. Me. Diane, I think yeah. they need to propose to Dr. Willicki what they're going to do. I'll share some information in that regard. Okay. Oh, if I can, can just share first, thank you. I mean, first that helps to know that their continued planning um, will be possibly um, leading to them being able to, to participate on the trip. I think that that's something that they will certainly benefit from hearing. So one of the things was whenever you, you fundraise, those monies cannot just be returned to the students should the trip not come to be. So they have already worked through that process in knowing that they can carry over that money in their individual accounts for next year. However, for the seniors, they're looking at utilizing it in a way that they could still benefit from those funds prior to their graduation. So that is something that should they raise the funds and were unable to approve it, um, they've already thought through that process, which is, which is great. For sub sales, um, they have, of course, um, not been able to hold several. I know they've held some alternative um, fundraisers in the meantime. When we met with, the, uh, rep with Mr. Bajarski, it was actually on October the 1st, which was right at the time period where we were still in that interim of the governor's um, appeal not being upheld. So on their meeting agenda, and I think it was actually that day that then the third court um, upheld it, so it kind of changed our discussion during our meeting because the initial request coming, planning on coming in to meet with us was that they resume their sub-sales. So sub-sales typically involve the students and the parents in preparing the subs using the high school cafeteria. Um, it does include, I say, more than 100 people involved in the process, right? It's a major production. So when we are under the limit, the social gathering of 25 in a space, just as we are here for our board meeting this evening, they too are under that limit of 25. So sub sales cannot be held during that time. So they were coming forward when we were kind of in that, that middle of the road period and not knowing what's going to happen. So let's say if the governor uh, makes a ruling that we're allowed a percentage of individuals um, in a facility for social gathering. So let's say that our cafeteria would be able to, or because it's um, inside a school facility, would be able to hold 120 people. One of the challenges we currently have is our cafeteria is set up with individual student desks because of social distancing. That would be a huge challenge to need to move all of those desks for a sub -sale. And that's something that, that they certainly understand and have already started to look at an outside location. So the challenge becomes it's still an activity that's under the umbrella of the school district. Therefore, they are still required to follow whatever social gathering restrictions that the district has. So a question that they proposed was what if the adults were to do the activity and not the students? And that's something I, I had shared that I wanted to take back to our solicitor to see if that makes any difference. Certainly if it's 25, it's 25. It doesn't matter if you have 25 adults or 25 students or a combination. But if we're able to increase the numbers or if the governor allows us to have more individuals present, we need to take a look at that. I have to say they are being very creative and, and innovative and in looking at how to approach this. 
we heard some of the ideas were bag your own sub, where they were going to to, to have a way that they could do it with fewer people and still um, have a Hempfield band sub. We heard they did look at having a um, company pre um, prepare them, but the profit margin was narrow that they didn't feel that that would be worth their time. So they are still brainstorming and looking at ways of how to still prepare the subs, but doing it under those limitations that we have. So I think at this point, I don't know that we can really have any further discussion with the sub sales until that 25 is lifted or we have a way, I don't want to say to work around it, but a way to work around it. Do we, do we know how many subs they make at once? I do not know the number. They used to make, it was about 10, 10 12,000 right. a day. I think Rob knows the number. 12 to 13,000. 13, Can't do it in shifts. Like have four shifts of 25. I think the difficulty becomes the timing because if you do it in shifts, you're now distributing them in, in the evening hours or, you know, they start very early in the morning to get them out early. I'm not sure, but that, that's an idea, Tony. I'm sure that they but are I, considering everything. I would think that um, if, if they could buy them from someone, then I'm not sure that it would matter if it came from another company or parents making them because if the students aren't involved, does it really matter? I would think it shouldn't matter. So, I mean, that's something you said you'll talk to right. solicitor, but I would think it shouldn't matter if it's the par coming from the parents. If you know what I mean? That should be okay, I would think. If the parents are making them. Yeah, that's, one of, that's what you had mentioned was one right. of the options, right? Right. So if we didn't have the limit of 25 people, if they could have 150 parents in a space making them, socially distanced, of course, but as a school district, we cannot approve a social gathering right now that's more than 25 people. But if it's parents, do, does the district have to approve well, it? Well, that, that was the question that they were asking, and I would want the solicitor, because we approve their fundraising events, which puts it under the umbrella of the district. Is, is, is that also the 25 per building? It, my understanding was 25 in a space, space. Like right now, we are not permitted to have more than 25 people in this room. I know, but what I'm asking is if, if they can figure out a way to have oh. 25 people in the cafeteria, 25 in the auditorium, 25, you know what I mean? Yes. Break it up. And we did talk about that because those 25 people would need to remain the same 25 people right. in that space. They couldn't commingle. Yep. And I think they took that back and said that would really be a challenge because of their... Their, their limit in spaces. I know they were looking at a local church and said that would really be. It'd be legal. It would be. <laughs> it would be. Well, I think we can take it back and certainly ask um, in regards to just the adults if that, you know, I'm not sure that that right now would make a difference unless they could do, as you're saying, Mike, with 25 in a room. If there's a way, they will figure it out. I know what they want to do is maintain the integrity of a Hempfield band sub. They want it to taste the same as a Hempfield band sub. So that was one of their, their concerns. Well, I think knowing that there's um, support, um, depending upon conditions and going forward with the trip, I think that will help them to continue to brainstorm to look at possible ways to figure out how to hold the sub sales because that is, again, the major fundraiser. Okay. If it's okay, then we'll move on to the next item. So I would like to give an update in regards to where we are with our reopening plan. I'm just gonna pull up some notes here to reference. Okay, so for <clears throat> the 2020 2021 school year, and looking at how we have um, addressed the opening of school to date. So first, the development of our cyber program, which continues to go strong. I think there are certainly um, many positives, especially our elementary program where our teachers have um, really come together and provide a high quality program that I'm sure the parents of, of the elementary hacker program would agree that certainly the decision to um, keep their children here with Hemfield area was the right decision. <clears throat> the next aspect of our plan is to move to full day kindergarten. So currently we, we started with half day and we are looking to transition for 
next Tuesday. We have an in-service day scheduled for Monday, which is October 12th. So our plan is to have full day kindergarten starting October the 13th. So taking kindergarten where you have, let's just use numbers of 10 in the morning and 10 in the afternoon, we are not able to just put those 20 children into the same classroom with the same teacher because our classroom sizes do not allow for social distancing of six feet when the number of children would be 20. So we are looking at class sizes of 16. Most of our kindergarten classrooms, that is um, the typical space. In some classes, it may allow for 17. And then this week, we are very busy at adding um, additional kindergarten classrooms. So our St. Vincent Fellows um, have agreed to assume the role of overseeing kindergarten classrooms. We're also looking at having two of our teachers that are currently at the elementary cyber program um, returning to brick and mortar and instructing in full day kindergarten. We're in the process of surveying. Um, we did survey kindergarten parents to learn how many are interested in having their children return for um, full day kindergarten. The next aspect of our plan is in regards to the end of the nine weeks. The end of the nine weeks is October 30th. So for parents who chose Hempfield Area Elementary Cyber, they were asked to commit to nine weeks. So this would be the 450 children that are atten attending HACA. We are in the process of distributing a survey to ask the parents how many are interested in continuing or how many would like to return to brick and mortar at this time. So our principals will be using that survey data to take a look at how that impacts class size and depending upon the grade level, that may impact more of rooms where we call overflow, meaning that, again, our classrooms average hold 16, 17 students. Uh, we cannot, we do not, we will not go over that number because of the six feet. So we may be looking at having children be a part of a class where they um, are not in their regular classroom one day, typically out of the five, and then we do a rotation. And then we use the lesson bot, we use um, collaboration between the teachers, so that instruction continues for the, those children in those days. Many times that includes their special, act, their special whether it be art, music, library, phys ed, and um, they continue to do their activities. I know Dr. Riefenack and I had an opportunity today when we were touring schools. We um, were able to visit three of the five schools today, and we were able to see several of those lessons um, occurring. I know West Hemfield Elementary, second grade, their overflow actually has 22 children, so they use the library so that they have a larger space for social distancing. We saw the organization of the carts. They had these baskets with the children's names and they were in the hallway um, located by the door. And the teacher that we had an opportunity to speak with was sharing how the students, they know the routine. They said they know when it's their day, they pick up their basket, they go to the library and they're instructed for the day and then the next four days they're back with their, um, their classroom teacher. So that, that, that seems to be working. We saw fifth grade at Fort Allen. We were able to see an art um, teacher. She was facilitating um, the lesson. She was actually monitoring the lesson, I'll use that word, as Mr. Mark Machoni, the fifth grade teacher, was instructing a math lesson. So he was using his lesson bot, and the students each had their Chromebooks, they had their headphones in, and we could see Mr. Machoni on the screen instructing the lesson as the students were completing their work. And he was responding to, at the time we were there, the questions of students that were physically in front of him but um, Mrs. Hedinger shared with us that he would pause periodically and then ask for questions from the students who were participating from her classroom. So I, I just want to applaud the efforts of our principals and teachers and really making this work. And it is an ever-changing situation because now we're, we're making changes to the schedule to accommodate full-day kindergarten, which is important for us to make that change first because very quickly, within two weeks, we'll be looking at the number of any children who want to return from um, HACA to brick and mortar so that we can then accommodate and do the same for those children. So just wanted um, to provide that, that update. So those surveys are being distributed. Tammy, I have a question on yes. the survey for the kindergarten. Yes. When the survey was sent out, were the parents notified that there's a potential that they would not get the same teacher? Because that's what yes. it sounds like. It was. The survey, it included several questions, and the one was, how comfortable would your child be if they were assigned to a new teacher? Okay. And certainly, we indicated that the class sizes would be smaller, and because of that, it would require some children to be moved to a new teacher. Okay. We also indicated that it may require them to be instructed in a different space, because we weren't sure at that time if we would be doing a similar model with the overflow, 
But the more that we gave that consideration, a five-year-old, it's really hard to be in a classroom four days with one teacher and then every fifth day to be changing. We felt the consistency was necessary, so therefore we were able to just create another classroom so that they could be instructed. Just, just as long because I know in some children just getting them from in kindergarten is difficult breaking them away from mom, dad, sure. or some can, grandma who's ever been with them. Hmm. Now that you've got that and then now as long as they understand that they might not be with the same teacher. Right. Okay. The principals are working to have as few changes as possible. So if we have children who are returning from HACA, so Mr. Simons, Mrs. Shuey will be returning. So looking at if they had one of those two teachers and they're back in their home school and scheduling them with that, home, that teacher as well. Good question. So I, I do want to hold for executives some discussion for next steps. I know that there is interest in when can we bring secondary students back every day. So that's something because of some of the associated challenges that I'd like to share an executive and then perhaps we'll um, have information to share at our next public meeting for the public. Mm -hmm. Nothing we can share with them. So I, I will share that we had an opportunity two weeks ago to meet with three of the physicians from Excella Health. That was not last week, but the week before. So Dr. Carol Fox, Dr. Heather Walker, and Dr. Jim Masterson. And our, my, I had a lot of questions just in now having school in session for 20 plus days in regards to considerations for how do we bring students back every day and what were their thoughts on the social distancing. And what we heard was that the six feet is really the gold standard. They shared that we should not consider increasing class size to the point where we have less than six feet. So that was something that for me reaffirmed the fact that we need to be very creative in our plan because I know here at the, at the high school we have classrooms that are, you know, the, the walls are not, um, they don't have partitions where we can open and make them larger. We're limited in the number of large spaces that we have, and therefore it is going to require some creative measures that sometimes involve um, some associated cost. Some of the other comments that, that we had, um, I'm trying to, what were some of the questions that we had answered? That's been two weeks ago, I'm trying to recall. Not to, uh, one of the items they mentioned is that they're seeing that um, surface contact Yes. that we originally thought was a huge concern was something that they thought reviewed and said it's more about the six feet and wearing masks um, being the gold standard and um, we hear from there are, there are other things talked about i mean quite a yes. few because we asked them specific questions and mm -hmm. and you um if if any board members ask questions about the opening and you think it has to go to executive we'll stop it right there but one question that was asked, and I think it was you, Mike, that asked about checking with Latrobe or other districts, and because I've heard, we've all heard they were opening. In fact, Latrobe opened last week, correct? And I think Connellsville's opening now to four, four days. Four. Yeah, so my question is, did you, did, was there any checking and how are they doing it that we can't or we aren't? So we, from what we gathered, we were told that they're using their spaces creatively, that they're using their larger spaces we heard lunches were being provided through tents um, to provide more um, space outside of the physical building and using the internal spaces very flexibly. So that, that is something that we are looking at as a, as a consideration. Okay. Of course, that runs into supervision when you're using more spaces more flexibly. So we, we do want to talk about that. Um, I know that with the surface transmission, that was something that elementary teachers talk about elementary children and the needs for physical education, I'm sorry, for recess, physical activity, for them to be able to participate. And certainly going outside and going for a walk is one thing, but the kids are really craving that opportunity to play some competitive games. So we talked about soccer, and they even said kickball would be something that would be acceptable. They didn't feel that there was a lot of concern with the children you know, sharing and, and playing kickball. Certainly prefer soccer, but um, that opportunity was there. I'm trying to think what were some of the other questions. I know I followed up later with them because with the transition to um, full day kindergarten, there were questions in regards to the sharing of lockers. And I know Dr. Um, Fox had responded that you know, if, if you're using a cubby and a child's coat's hanging and another child's coat, there wasn't concern with transmission from one garment to another. 
you say that one it was or was not? Was not. not. Was was not. not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things I remember from uh, the, the discussion was, I, I think that there was a question about, um, uh, Tony, you mentioned Latrobe and some of the others, what they're doing. And to paraphrase, I think one of the responses or the response from the Excella folks was, in effect, why are you worried about what others are doing? Hempfield has a really good plan. So, you know, that that's one of the takeaways I took from it. So I just thought it, I thought it's worth highlighting that. Yeah, they <clears throat> they did say that, Paul. And and um, but in my mind, I mean, the, the most complaints I've ever gotten has been on on this. I mean, there are people who want it all open. There are people who don't. I'm sure other board members have heard it. Since other districts are doing things differently than we're doing, the parents are out there wondering, and the students are actually wondering. The students, a lot of them, I, I talk to a lot of the kids, and they feel, you know, they want it to go back to normal. I think we all do. <clears throat> but seeing that, you know, Latrobe has a few doctors on their board and, and doctors involved, too, and who they're talking to, I don't know. And Jim Masterson did specifically say that our plan was uh, a very, very good plan, and that's what we should be concerned about. But we, you know, to, to make our plan the best, we do need to know what other people are doing. It isn't competition. It's whatever we can all do to make this better for them. I had a question for them and they didn't have an answer to it. I knew they wouldn't. Was, you know, after this one's over, what are we going to do? Start wearing masks all next year and social distance for the flu. Because, again, I, I made this comment earlier. The flu is more deadly to the children than this is, apparently. And is this going to carry over from now on? Is this the new normal? You know, and we, we as a school board, we need to fight for as much normalcy as we can get safely, but we need to make sure that we don't get caught in the trap where we're just all of a sudden running away from germs. And, and that is going to really hurt our children down the road. It really is. So I would hope we're as aggressive as we can be safely, but aggressive as we can be opening up. If other districts are doing it and they're doing it successfully and things are going well for them, um, I know, Tammy, that you guys will do it here too the best you can. And I, I'm not saying you're not. I just would hope that that's always on the plate table and, um, and we're moving forward. And, and I, I, I loved what Excella had to say for us, to us. They were very good and uh, they gave us good ideas. And, you know, our, your plan is fantastic. Our plan is fantastic. So. That was a gist I got from the whole thing. Any board questions on opening to uh, four or anything else? Tammy's going to share some of it in executive session that she feels it's more appropriate for that. But if you have questions or comments, go, go right ahead. There are other board members on that call, I think. <coughs> God bless you. Thank you. Okay. That will move to our next item. The focus of tonight's meeting is to include a review of the 2019-2020 school year in regards to evaluation purposes for Dr. Connor and I. We're going to evaluate you in public. We're going to share the information in public. If I can get to the website for Canva. I'm not going to be on this password. Is, oh, I am saved. We thought the information, we should be able to share our goals in public, but then we'll move into executive for discussion in regards to feedback. So we are going to present information and we're going to do it together. And I think it really shows the fact that our work is so connected. In fact, in looking at this, you're going to see information from the principals because our work is so connected and it has to be. In order for us to move forward, we have to be working together as a cohesive team. So there's a lot of connections between my goals, Dr. Connor's goals, what were Dr. Gross's goals, and the principal's goals. So the first part that we wanted to share was in regards to the tool of how we were um, presented in past years. And I know there's some consideration in changing the tool. And we would like to ask that we continue to use the tool from last year just because that's the tool into which we have organized our documentation, our evidence. But then at the end of this meeting, end of this presentation, we'd like to provide an opportunity to talk about going forward because certainly I think that it, there's always room for improvement in the process. And even as we were looking at um, this, this, this particular tool, we see some areas for improvement. 
And I think we do have some examples from some other areas that we could look at, and there are probably a lot of commonalities across those as well. So there are six areas that um, are a part of our current evaluation system. So student growth and achievement, I think that's really the heart of everything that, that we do. I mean, academics, it's really about preparing our students for their future. So I know from past discussions that really there's a desire to have more observable, measurable data. So we have really, and what we'll share with you, had our principals work on goals that are observable and measurable, and really looking at interim ways to measure progress in achieving those goals. Our goals are really built around the PSSA keystones because those are the way in which we are measured as a school district and many times put up against and compared to other school districts. But at the same time, we are using many tools that provide interim ways of monitoring progress. This is probably a really good meeting for Dr. Riefenack for her first meeting because she will be a part of this as well and going forward. So I know um, in the past we used Ames Web. We're now using Star 360. The middle schools are using high school CDTs. They're using <coughs> tools that allow us to provide benchmark assessments to be able to share and to be able to say this is the progress that we're seeing throughout the year so we're not just waiting until what's typically October until we receive that data. So organizational leadership is the second part. And certainly around um, vision development, I think even our mission and all the work that we do and, and even just reading our mission statement at our board meetings reminds us that that's certainly a huge part of everything that we do. Um, the ability to identify and rectify problems. Well, if there's every year that we've been doing that, I would say it started in March and it has been the focus of every day. Our team, thank you, our team has truly I have to say, if you look back at what we were doing at the beginning of March, and then when school closed on March 13th, we built a new school system with the work and support of our teachers, department chairs, HAEA, principals. We really built a new system to open within two weeks, so we'll, we'll share some more in that regard. Um, best practices for instruction, supervision, curriculum development, and management. That's everything we do in service days. Um, we work with the half hours, our principals in their faculty meetings. So this is the heart of our principal meetings. We now have separate administration meetings that are about management and principal meetings that are about instructional leadership. Um, climate and culture. You know, that's really the heart of everything that, that we are about. Um, I think in walking Dr. Riefenack through our district today, she's getting a sense of what is the culture here at Hemfield area? What do we value? Um, what's important to us? And then how does that look in practice? So, certainly areas that we have to continuously have a pulse. Our operations and fiscal management. We know, again, this is a year when there are many concerns around um, the fiscal aspect. So this part really relates to my work um, with our business manager, with our principals, and looking at our limited resources and how do we best use those. This is a rule that Dr. Connors, he shares his job description, has some impact, but his job description we're going to see very much um, relates more heavily to the first two areas on this slide. The final three areas, communication and community relations, we spend hours every day. You know, today, right before 4 o'clock, 4.30, when we were sending out communication in regards to our situation at Fort Allen. Communication, you know, timely, is it clear, is it concise, and, and really being able to um, talk with our staff, just informal conversations that we have when we're walking through a building. Um, articulate and building support for district goals. We have a comprehensive plan that we have continuously said that will not become a shelf document. We have four goals, and I would think that if we ask teachers that have been here for at least two years, they most likely could tell, at least if not stating it word for word, I'm sure, the gist of those four goals, because that is what we are all about. Um, local and broader issues affecting the district. Um, certainly, I think of the work that was done in providing food to all of our students free every day is addressing a broader issue for our students. And short and long range planning, which is what we um, are sharing with you our, our um, goals from last year, but certainly we'll be looking to you to have conversations in regards to future goals, whether they're long or short range. HR, we're very fortunate to have Bob Rieger, who certainly carries a lot of the load in this regard. Um, but certainly that's a, that's a huge part that we play as well, and certainly in doing interviews and selecting staff. When we select teachers for our school district, that's just, that teacher has an impact on hundreds of students for years to come. And not just the teaching staff, but all staff, when you look at the impact that everyone has from our custodians, our secretaries, our bus drivers, I mean, there's just, it's, um, it's a, a cycle that everyone is working together in order to keep moving forward. And professionalism, and that's certainly the one that 
Um, we think that Dr. Connor and I, in everything that we do, we are being um, viewed as being an image of Hemphill Area School District, so professionalism is certainly important. So we started to put together information to share with you tonight in regards to these six areas. So the first thing that we want to share are our job descriptions because this really outlines what it is that um, is at least on paper for what we are to be doing each year. Dr. Connor, you want to go first and I'll sure. present. Thank you very much. Um, when you take a look at the Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Education job description, which I have uh, followed to the greatest extent that I can for the past three years in the school district, um, there's several different things listed. And what I try to do, um, bringing back to those associated objective performance standards on top, I try to create a um, little bit of a, um, a correlation between the job duties that are assigned to me and what uh, performance standard that I viewed them under. Um, as Dr. Wolicki alluded to, there are some performance standards that really don't fit too well with my job, but other ones that obviously I hit um, very heavy. Um, first and foremost, supervising and evaluating the elementary principals and, and supporting their work um, in creating goals um, as we try to improve student achievement and learning throughout the district. Um, then when you look at the, the development of written curriculum to align to state standards and uh, common district assessments to judge um, our um, learning progress, followed by the textbook adoption uh, process that um, Assistant Superintendent for Secondary and Elementary co-facilitate co for the district and we present to you every March those um, curriculum adoptions. Staff development across the district um, to help support our curriculum. Also evaluating all programs in the elementary level and committees related to it. Um, the gifted program with curriculum instruction and scheduling of students and um, ESL for the K-12 uh, program. Also, um, you probably see um, at nauseum the federal programs for the week weekly reports. Um, there's a lot of funds that we get from the federal government that um, the elementary assistant superintendent reviews um, and ensures that um, we are staying compliant with all the rules that go with it. Also the Ready to Learn grant, which helps to uh, fund our full day kindergarten program here for the past several years. Um, looking in, in coordination with the Human Resource Department, any um, elementary positions, screening those applicants and coordinating the scheduling of those interviews and making recommendations to the school board. Um, the next item you'll see um, is the effective implementation of multi-tiered systems of support. That, that's really a broad way of saying that we are meeting students' needs. So we all know that all students learn at various um, paces and degrees. So if you have a, a good system of support, you meet those students where they're at and help provide intervention to make sure that they're all meeting um, those benchmarks as we progress up the grade levels. Um, Communication is huge when you start talking about uh, responding to parent concerns regarding any type of um, elementary program um, and issues relating to those. I am um, attendance board meetings and um, related HAEA issues and parent meetings. Also the assignment within district requests uh, that relates to our policy where um, parents can request to attend schools where they are not um, living in the boundaries. So we, we looked at those on a case-by-case -case basis based on enrollments to ensure that we have the necessary staffing to support that. Um, also one of the rules is supervising central duplicating to ensure that we are um, monitoring the use of our paper consumption versus um, using the technology that we're providing to our staff and students. And supervising the uh, pupil ser supervisor of pupil services and special education um, and working with them on related issues for elementary. Looking at the transition for our elementary students to middle school and the student placement matrix. Uh, facilitating the development of comprehensive plan and submission of all those related reports. Community partnerships, annual report, supervision and evaluation um, committee and, and that process throughout the district and making sure that it, 
occurs and we're monitoring that. Um, committee meetings to inform of PD guidelines in regards to that. Supervision evaluation handbook. Uh, the SLO process for all the grade levels at the elementary. PAE TEP, again, the supervision process is that that's a program that is used for that. And supervision survey, um, which is a TPES report that goes to the state. Um, that's also one of the roles of the elementary assistant superintendent that maintain our compliance. Um, co facilitated the instructional technology committee, um, continue to do that. Prepare budgetary documents and related to the elementary. Communication on board policies, administrative regulations. Volunteer policy, although unfortunately this year we've limited our number of volunteers across the district because of the COVID situation. Handbooks, enrollment, um, I'm sure you guys get tired of hearing those enrollments over the summer, but we do monitor those very closely to make our staffing recommendations. So we are um, using staff to the best of their abilities and, and making sure that we're not overstaffed or understaffed. Um, prepare all data for redistricting whenever it's it's applicable evaluating uh, department chair looking at assessment data and looking and making sure this data is shared with the school board and public workshop requests which is goes back to that title two funds and federal programs student teaching which is huge and very important um, one of the items that i say that when we look at we have to support the development of new teachers in our field especially now more than ever when we look at the unfortunate trend that we have um, and uh, not that many people are getting into the field so we need to make sure that we're supporting that and um, I look very closely at that role and looking and partner with our local universities and try to support that as best I can pre-kindergarten transition activities uh, the induction program for all of our new teachers I co facilitate that with the assistant superintendent for secondary Assist principals and plans of assistance for any staff that are experiencing difficulties. And um, basically that last one is um, any other duties that are assigned by the superintendent. And we're not going to go into what those are because they vary from day to day and um, part of the team. That's how I look at it. And it's a great team. I'm sure Dr. Rifanek is looking at this saying, oh my, I have to do all of that, which we did share this with her as part of the interview process. And certainly, it's always something that we take a look at, and even Dr. Connor and I looked on Friday and started to say there's some need for revisions because there are some things that, that are now being addressed that maybe weren't whenever this was developed. So I want to say Dr. Connor certainly um, is willing to assist in any and all ways. He is always saying, you know, what, what needs done, what can I, how can I help? And, and the team, I think, is just such a huge part. Even in dealing with um, the situation today, I have to say our um, team very quickly came together and started looking at what needs to be done and how could we all be a part of of helping um, during a time of need. So for my job description, I linked it here and I'm going to share it with you, but I don't think it's as important for me to go through in detail because I'm kind of responsible for everything. Where what I wanted Dr. Connor um, in, in sharing his format was to see that I think what becomes a challenge, and I know this from being the assistant superintendent for elementary, is sometimes the rubric doesn't always align as easily to his job description. I think it fits better with mine, but his areas of focus, really as he just shared with his job description, tend to fit um, only several areas of the six that, that we take a look at, which he certainly um, addresses all of those very well. So my job description, and I realize this is not attached for you because I'm using a Canva presentation, so I'm kind of just sharing it with you as board members in separate emails, so you'll continue to get emails. So this job description was developed when I assumed the role in 2015, 14, 15, 16. 14 was assistant for, and then for superintendent was three years later. Yeah, so whenever I assumed the role after Dr. Marin had retired. So this would be to, this one was to. Again, I'm not going to go into great detail, but did want to share with you the job description because this may be something that as we talk about next steps, we may want um, to have a committee or to have all of you take a look at this. And please, it, it is something that can be revised and I would prefer that, that we have that discussion and it be revised and I know what are the um, expectations so that I can continue to work toward those. Okay, next, after job descriptions. So the comprehensive plan, and I mentioned this is not becoming a shelf document so 
we took the work of the comprehensive plan very seriously. We had a committee in which even as you can, if you can see the picture, there are individuals in this picture that are no longer you know, employed. I see Mr. Coover here that's not been with us for quite a few years. So this work started um, a number of years ago and the plan was, was put into place and we're now at our midpoint where we're to be sharing our progress toward our goals. And our four task forces um, really were off to a strong start prior to COVID. And this is something that we plan to continue. So I know many of you were a part of our task forces, so we plan to continue that work. Um, I believe Dr. Connor um, really led with his work with the math task force. They had several meetings, developed action plans, and really took that, that huge leap. Um, I took responsibility for the first task force, which was a literacy, and that was one that I asked Mr. Saracini to assist me with just because of his expertise in that regard. So we are continuing to work on goals in helping to create systems for our students to become literate citizens, numerate, numerate citizens. Um, goal three, this was one that Dr. Gross had assumed responsibility for um, becoming independent college and career ready citizens. So as we move forward, we're looking at shifting that responsibility to Dr. Connor and Dr. Riefenack will pick up um, the mathematics, which is actually a part of her background and expertise. Goal four is under Dr. Maloney's um, direction and this is um, cultivating self-awareness, self-management, establishing and maintaining relationships, and practicing um, social problem solving. So whenever you think about our PBIS, all of those actions would fall under these goals. So um, we are continuing, of course, to work with our comprehensive plan. So these goals drive everything else that we do as far as goals with our principles. I want to just share um, briefly our administrative retreat. So this is something we did not have an opportunity to do this year for the current year. But in August of 2019, goals were set for all departments as a part of the retreat. So I'll just share quickly um, some of the goals by department. always starting with our mission, our vision, our belief statements, and it's not going to give me the slides. I'll just mention them. I actually have them on paper. So this is where we have every department set goals. So for facilities, they um, set goals, athletics, for business office, um, just every area. So I'll just mention a couple. So for our business office, um, they were developing a district HVAC replacement plan, and I know there was a lot of work done, um, especially here at the high school, um, on HVAC um, with the age of our system, certainly that requires a lot of attention with our roofing. And there was information shared with the board here in our Friday um, update in regards to um, updates to our, our roofing. Food service, working on the grab and go, and those are certainly um, up and operational. HR, um, Bob's department, working on need for teachers participating in professional development while balancing costs. So we're certainly looking at the GCNs and how that can be addressed. Um, taking advantage of the new functionality of the web-based FIS data management system. Negotiations of our teacher's contract, which we are continuing. Special education, so Darla was setting action based on corrective um, actions from the audit. So I won't go into detail with all, but it certainly I can link and share and share the individual slides where we talked about the goals for every department from the previous year to the next year. So we did not yet have a, an administrative retreat, and I know that's something with COVID we, we delayed, but something I think we should at some point circle back because that helps us to know the direction of the board so that we can be sure that we are focusing time and effort in that regard. Are there any questions to that point? Back, I know there's a lot of information. So the administrative retreat was in August. We want to mention the curriculum cycle. So our goal is to have every six, seven years an opportunity to work through the curriculum revision process with every department. So this is where individuals are, they either volunteer or they are asked to be a part of this um, committee work where we do intensive work over a three-year process. So the process includes one year of plan, another year of design, and the third year of implementation. So in the year 2019-2020, there was a plan process started with the Committee for Art, Music, and Physical Education. And I know that was an abbreviated process because typically that work occurs more in the second semester and we all know the world changed in the second semester. 
So the design was um, under the work of the ELA committee, and we've talked about Dr. Jerry Thompson and the work that she's doing with our ELA committee, so that work certainly continues. Family and Consumer Science, um, their design work continued, and implementation. So we had the middle school, and if you remember, we had the middle school had really strong scores in comparison from the previous year with the use of Eureka Math, and there were some concerns in transitioning to illustrative math but they made the leap in thinking that really while one was good, the other was even better. So that implementation occurred in 2019, 2020, as well as our library science. So this is a lot of work that is overseen by Dr. Connor, at the time it was Dr. Gross, and really working with all of those committees in that process. We wanna share what's on the plate for 2020, 2021. So plan will include gifted and BCIT. In the design phase, now that the, they all move forward one year, so the planning that occurred last year, really we're going to do a plan slash design to keep moving forward to have art, music, and physical education, and we'll be looking at implementation for ELA and family and consumer, family and consumer science was implementation. I have that wrong. That's not, yeah. yeah, that's right. So we wanted to mention just because we think it is a, a continuous process for improvement. Okay, principal goals. We want to share these goals as well. So for the elementary, and Dr. Connor, do you want to take this part? Sure. And you may, um, the school board members may re remember this presentation. This was done, I believe, last... Valentine's Day. February yeah, February. 20. So we asked our building principals to come and present um, during that superintendent's report at that meeting, and this was the presentation. And you can see um, they had our goals, which were outlined at our administrative re retreat as Dr. Willicke just reviewed. And this presentation kind of reviewed the midpoint as to how those um, goals were going and the data provided. And there's several different things that are listed. And uh, for elementary, there was a goal that was written for math. There's one that was written for ELA. And there's one that was um, reviewing the implementation of um, school-wide PBIS. And you'll see that presentation there. I, I won't spend a lot of time reviewing it with you since you've already seen it, but a lot of these links will take you to some of the um, tasks and um, professional developments that were provided at the building level to get us to those mm -hmm. points. I was really proud of the work that we did at the elementary level last year, trying to um, utilize data on an interim basis, um, the benchmarks to really look at our progress and really reacting to it. Um, every building created 60-day plans in preparation for the PSSAs. Um, I was really proud of what they were accomplishing. Um, it's kind of sad or scary to say that I'm, I'm sad that we didn't take our PSSAs this past school year because I, I was excited to see the, the, um, the gains in those areas, but we really made a lot of strides in that, in that way, looking at data on a daily basis and really um, revising our instruction accordingly areas that Dr. Riefenack will pick up and continue this year. Middle school shared a presentation at that same uh, meeting as well in February with you and their information they had shared a lot about students taking ownership and responsibility setting goals based upon their individual data so they were using CDTs and having students again set goals and then monitor their growth in the achievement of their goals. They were also very proud as they should be and we are as well of their achievement of the schools to watch process and that's where two of our three buildings um, achieved that status and it's really unfortunate because that announcement came out again right prior to COVID and really it was an opportunity we were looking forward to some great celebrations but um, we, we still celebrated with them but we just know that it, it kind of um, that the timing was was such so we will continue to work with the middle school this year Dr. Connor will assume that role in setting their goals and the high school, and we should have Mr. Saracini share this, they set goals in literacy where they uh, were using MyPath as a means to determine where students um, kind of to individualize instruction for them, um, working, I'm sorry, with CDTs to determine where the needs were using MyPath as the response um, during the lab time that was created. So this was really providing extra time for students with instruction that was very targeted and specific to what their needs would be. And did the same with math, with the Algebra One labs. And again, looking forward to seeing the progress, but as Dr. Connor shared, we did not have assessments 
in the spring that we are unable to present data to show the achievement of those goals, but we know that students were uh, making progress in that regard, and certainly that system we can continue to implement. I'll just open that a second time for some reason. Okay, so moving from the principal goals, which really filter from our goals, we want to then go to our goals. So we'll start with Dr. Connors. And I think you'll see very close alignment between my goals and the elementary uh, principal goals. And really it's looking at increasing our math achievement and our reading achievement by five points. And when you look at these documents, you'll see the action steps that I had laid out to uh, accomplish that. And then um, after we get to get through this, you'll see the next document kind of lays out the evidence as to how I accomplish those those items. Um, I know I'm jumping Definitely. around and I apologize. That's okay, we'll catch up to you. So okay. what I did in, in this document, and hopefully this looks familiar from last school year, the way it's laid out, but it takes those objectives, um, the six objectives that we discussed at the beginning, um, has the, the indicators on the left-hand side and has items that were done um, on the right-hand side to show evidence of, of them being attacked and, and accomplished um, down way through. And then if you go to the very bottom of this document, you'll see those three SMART goals and um, the results from each laid out. Um, but unfortunately, some of those um, are um, not In finished complete. because of the um, standardized assessments being postponed and canceled. But, and then finally, um, the one other item or items are the major accomplishments laid out. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of our elementary cyber program um, that we created over the summer and um, have going full force right now. Um, the uh, other item is the co-facilitation of the discipline committee and the code of conduct K through 12 that were, was established by that committee. I thought it was very impressive work and, and it really aligns to that school-wide positive behavior intervention systems that are in eight of our nine um, buildings, co-facilitating the Instructional Technology Committee and also um, the ELA curriculum and where we're at to this point in the implementation this school year. Thank you, Dr. Connor. So my um, screen is set up the same way and I will share these links with you as well. So the SMART goals, and mine were set up as three-year goals, just because these are really developing systems, which are nearly impossible to do in a single year. And they're really, again, around very similar to the principal's goals, to Dr. Connor's goals, to the comprehensive plan goals. So it's really around student achievement and increasing scores in mathematics and literacy. So the SMART goals are in red. And again, those are areas, unfortunately, that we do not have um, scores to show our achievement since um, the assessments um, were not administered. Um, I also had a goal around a culture of learning for our administrators and um, teachers and really doing this for our principals around the understanding by design framework and really that evidence is around the um, agenda, the meeting agendas and the work that we're doing in developing that written curriculum, which leads into the third goal, um, developing a framework of written curriculum assessment um, that provides equitable education and that evidence would be through our written units of instruction. So that's the work that we did, we're doing this year with Dr. Jerry Thompson with our ELA committee. So wanted, and I, I again will share all of these links with you. The next document is, as Dr. Connor shared, one that should be familiar, and I believe this based on your feedback from last year, you found this to be helpful in completing the evaluation process, is where we outlined um, our evidence on the right side. So we have updated these for you so you can see what work we did during the past year for each of those areas. And the major accomplishments, um, there are many, many areas of which I'm very proud of our team. Um, the middle schools and their schools to watch process. And certainly while we had two of the three schools, we look forward to the third school being recognized as well. Also very proud of the work that was done in collaboration with the workforce development. We were able to hold a countywide career fair for students in eighth grade across the county. So that was something I was a part of the um, the task force that, that worked in that regard and have to say we were very proud of that outcome and unfortunately could not provide a repeat um, this fall. The response of our team to the pandemic, I'm very proud of um, the work that was done across the entire district and certainly while we recognize it was not perfect, it certainly was a foundation for which we could improve upon um, for this school year. 
and the cyber program in K-12. I mean, certainly, as Dr. Connor shared, the elementary program, I mean, that, that was totally built from the ground up into a, a school of its own that's operating. And even with the work that our secondaries, t secondary teachers are doing now that allow students to participate in remote instruction. So the final piece we want to share with you is um, we actually created a tool for you in making this digital. We know that that was a goal. And the digital tool that PSBA provided was actually linked to a different rubric. So we created a Google survey for you that you will be able to complete. So Mr. Rieger shared um, the paperwork on the physical packet, which you can certainly use as you're referring. Um, but we've also then created this document, which allows you to identify which of us, which individual you are um, evaluating. And it's all the questions that are on paper. And you just indicate your scores. And at the end, and we'll have this set up to where um, Tony will be the owner of the document. We will not have access to it. And then he will be able to um, share and and present those scores so that you can then come together to compile them. We thought that would make it much easier than all the papers. I just want to mention that each of the areas, as you can see even on paper, it asks, as you consider first each of the criteria, you then make a determination for that, I'll use the word domain, um, overall. And I think that would probably help in combining this at the end as you're making those decisions. So next steps. We, we will, um, it's, it's a survey that we will make Tony the collaborator and then we will take ourselves off so that then only Tony can control then who else receives it and can see those scores. Tony will be sending, Tony will be sending that to you, okay. yes. Yep. So next steps. So we would like to talk about updating job descriptions just because we feel that there probably are some areas and I know we already work now. Dr. Connor presented the elementary. We worked on Friday. Um, updating his secondary, was that Friday? One of the days last week. We looked at um, taking a look at where we felt there could be some revisions. So we would like to um, present those to you here in the, in the near future and then talking about an evaluation tool. So I know that um, Dr. Smith had shared several tools that were presented. Um, some of the areas are similar, but there are some areas that are different. I know advocacy um, is an area that I know is um, on some of the tools that I thought might be of interest but wanted to um, kind of just present that as maybe an idea of a committee coming together and looking at the, the different tools and coming up with the process. But Dr. Connor, Dr. Rifanak, and I will certainly work toward whatever tool is decided. It would um, just be helpful if we work on that sooner so we can start to align our evidence to that particular tool. And that's a very long report. I apologize. But we did want to share all that we've been doing and really how all those pieces fit together because it really is a team effort and something that if we're not all working very well together, we don't keep moving forward. And certainly we have a, a, an excellent team and we're able to do that. And that concludes my long report. And then we could go back, we could actually conclude and then go into executive. Before we do, I have a couple things. Um, I have a text message out to George Reese to try and come up with one of the last two Wednesdays to have a meeting between all of us. Um, I had talked to you all about the Wednesdays, and that seemed like a good day. Um, we haven't been able to talk yet, but we'll be getting that. Second thing I wanted to bring up, and I'll bring it up in the public, is I talked to Dr. or I talked to Tammy the other day, last week, and asked her about possibly restarting some board um, visitations to different schools again, um, as long as it doesn't get in the way of what the team is doing or whatever what the school district's doing, and it's done in safety. And I think that you had thought that was a good idea, too, because then we can see how they're opening and what they're doing and give us a better bird's eye view. And of course, it wouldn't be all of us because that would exceed the amount. So we would not be able to do what we did last year where we actually had um, a sit down and conversation with the teachers. It would be more of a walk through. I think that would be important, though. And we can discuss that as time goes on and maybe set it up for those that are interested. I'm very interested in seeing it, and, and I'm sure other people would be and then share it with the rest of the board. Um, Greg, I do see, is he still there? Yep. You are very helpful. You got the sun out of our eyes. I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, there you go. And then do we, uh, on this, I saw a hearing of citizens. We don't have any citizens today. We do not. Right? So we can.
adjourn the public meeting. We'll adjourn it in one minute. Uh, one, uh, one last thing, and I know this might be out of time, but we lost two uh, wonderful people these past two weeks, and Eddie Coletta, and is it Alex Negi? And that was Pam, our secretary's, uh, you can pronounce her last name if you want. Gibisevich. But that was Pam's son. Uh, no, no mother should lose a child, ever. It shouldn't happen. We're a father, lose a child. And I'd just like to take a moment, to have a moment of silence and a prayer um, to yourself, for those people to yourself. And I've heard nothing but good about Alex, and I know Eddie very, very well. And seeing the things I've been on Facebook about Eddie and how involved he was with these children and the love shown to him. I mean, I was involved in recreation for a long, 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 long time um, with the recreation board in Hemfield and Youngwood's recreation board and coaching for a number, number of years. And I have never seen anything like that in my life. So it just goes to show you what type of an individual this young man was. And I'm sure Alec was just as good and just as deep. So it's really tragic we lose two people of, of that caliber and, and of those circumstances. So uh, ending with all that, any, anything for them to go to the board for the meeting? If nothing, uh, do I have a motion for an adjournment? Second.